Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start. Hi, everyone on Zoom. Uh, so today we have uh, Dr. Cheryl Dalid. Dr. Cheryl Dalid is a biological scientist three working as an assistant breeder at the University of Florida Strawberry Breeding Program. She earned her bachelor's degree in biology and her master's degree in genetics at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. She completed her PhD in plant, soil, and environmental science with a concentration in plant breeding and a minor in statistics at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Dr. Dalid applied phenomics in the strawberry breeding program. She's also involved in feed evaluations and selections, management of crosses, marker-assisted selection, data management, as well as statistical analyses. So with that, please help me welcome Dr. Cheryl Dalit. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for that introduction. So today I'm going to present about an exciting topic or project from our breeding program, and this is about the high throughput field phenotyping and its application in the UF strawberry breeding program. So just to, um, to mention high throughput uh, field phenotyping or high throughput phenotyping uh, involves the rapid collection of data uh, on a large amount of plant materials in a short span of time. So imagine uh, having all this information um, we, uh, we are able to get as much um, information from our plant materials and with just like, um, as I mentioned, with a short amount of time. And this usually involves um, using high resolution images, using drones or uh, ground-based platforms. And uh, with our project, we've used the ground-based platform. So before we start, uh, I just wanted to give a brief overview of our breeding uh, program, just for people who are not familiar with it. I know you're familiar with where our uh, our field is, our strawberry field is, but it's good to have uh, this overview so that everyone understands what kind of activities we do in our breeding program. So with that, we start planting around uh, late September to October. And uh, this is simultaneous with the planting season of the growers here in Florida as well. And uh, from November to March is where all our data collection um, happens. Uh, so this data collection is weekly um, measurement of yield-related traits and fruit quality traits, even disease, uh, disease trials are um, collected here in this uh, period. And at the same time, we do our field selections and evaluations. This involves us going to the field every week, uh, looking at plants, selecting the best ones, or uh, selecting the plants that we think have the potential to be the next variety or the parent of the next cycle of our crosses. And the next one is our crossing activity also happens during this season. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, crossing just involves two different uh, strawberries where we combine them to create new breeding materials. So this all happens at the same time. But um, when the season is over, usually mid-March, or it could also uh, end by early March, so it depends on how hot the weather could be. So that's the time when we start our marker-assisted seedling selection. And we do this in collaboration with the Strawberry Molecular Genetics and Genomics Lab. So from 
this is where um, we are going to grow our seedlings that are products from our crosses. If you remember crosses in the greenhouse, we produce seeds from that and we grow those seeds to have these seedlings. And typically we end up with approximately 70,000 seedlings uh, per year. And that's a lot of seedlings and we cannot accommodate that in our uh, field. And so what we do is that we use molecular markers. So these molecular markers are associated with important traits of interest that we have, like for example, disease resistance, fruit quality traits, so that we select those seedlings that have those traits and we narrow them down to 15,000 seedlings. And from those 15,000 seedlings will then be allowed to grow. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And uh, they will be packed and shipped by June and they will be sent to our summer nursery in Malin, Oregon for plant propagation. And then when September comes again, they will be dug out from our summer nursery and uh, in preparation for another fruit production season here in Florida. Hello, Sheila. We don't yeah. see the presenting slide at June. Pardon? We don't see the presenting slide at June. Oh, okay. Can you see it now? Yeah, I see. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on, I just, because I've been mentioning breeding materials. So what are our breeding materials um, in the strawberry breeding program? Um, I don't know if you've heard us mentioning we have stage one, stage two, stage three, but what are those? So stage one is again, our seedlings. So once they are propagated in the summer nursery, so they are sent back here in Florida and we grow them in rows and rows of strawberries. And that is our stage one. And uh, if you're familiar with our field, this is the field where we have a lot of yellow flags and those yellow flags are the selected seedlings that we have. So we have different uh, categories. We have main, early, wild, or miscellaneous. Main category is just the main uh, breeding um, material for our program. Early is uh, cross combinations that could have early yielding materials. Wild are cross combinations with wild relatives of strawberries. Miscellaneous just includes some uh, disease, uh, some cross combinations for disease resistance or for fruit quality traits or for um, collaborative projects as well. So now we move to the advanced selections. So we have uh, whatever is selected from the stage one will move to our stage two, which is where we do our preliminary yield trial. And uh, mm -mm. okay. Now I okay, there you go. So now these are the traits. Uh, that we measure during that time. So we have average weight. So the this is per per fruit. Uh, a marketable number. So this is just uh, the count of how many marketable fruits that we have. Marketable fruits are considered when they are uh, when they are not deformed or they their weight is greater than ten grams. So we also have early marketable yield. Early marketable yield falls under um, yield during November to January. And 
total marketable yield is the yield from the total season. Soluble solid, we measure this using bricks. Uh, total calls, these are the fruits that didn't make it to the marketable uh, yield. These are the ones that are uh, weighing less than 10 grams or are deformed, misshapen fruits. And firm, firmness is uh, a score of one to five being one, uh, one being the softest and five being the firmest. And um, so based on uh, the data from this stage two materials, in addition to uh, field evaluations again and marker information, disease information, we select the best ones to be moved to our stage three, which is our advanced yield trial. This is a smaller trial, which usually is made up of 15 genotypes. Around five of these genotypes are uh, cultivar checks and approximately 10 uh, new selections. And these are grown as a 10 plant, pla a 10 plant plot in, with five replications. And we also uh, measure the marketable weight here. And you, uh, whatever is promising in this stage three could be the next cultivar that we release. But before that, we also grow them in grower trials because one important thing in our program is that we also uh, want to see them in a whole, in a bigger field. And also we get input from our growers if uh, they think a uh, variety is, this uh, specific genotype is worth releasing and it'll be beneficial for them. So important breeding objectives that we have, of course, it's important to have consistent fruit quality and flavor. Who would want to eat strawberries that are not good tasting, right? So this is really important for our program. And at the same time, early and consistent yield. Why is that? As I mentioned earlier, early yield, November to January. So in Florida, we grow strawberries during winter, and this starts from November until mid of March. But the, the early period, which is uh, early to January, is a time when the California, uh, when the supplies of strawberries from California and from Mexico are still low, and the prices of strawberries are still high. And so the, our growers uh, would like to take advantage of that period for them to be more profitable. And we really want to help them achieve that by selecting early yielding materials. And disease resistance, probably everyone knows. Disease resistance, Florida is very conducive for a lot of diseases. And I bet you've heard about the new um, strawberry disease, the neopestalosopsis. So that's actually one of our priority um, disease that we want to uh, develop resistance to that. And lastly, we have the harvest efficiency, which includes low call rate, conical shape, large and consistently sized fruits, robust but open plant architecture, moderate plant size. Why is this important? This is important because um, this reduces cost of labor as well. Because if the if it's easy to see the fruits from your plants, it's easier, it's faster to harvest them. And at the same time, if it has low cost, then you'll get more fruits out of them, more marketable fruits. So with this, um, the, the project regarding um, measuring plant biomass or vegetative biomass started. And actually we call it our phenomics project. So this project um, started with uh, um, Dr. Amir's group, the geomatics group at the Plant, si uh, plant City um, campus. So, um, just wanted to show you how we set up the field for this. So 
for the phenomics project, we have two beds. And from this bed, from each bed, we have 16 different plots. And each plot consists of approximately 17 genotypes. And um, every week, we uh, destroy each plot from each field to collect data. And our aim for this, and at the same time, we also uh, collect image data. And the goal for this is to develop um, a model to predict vegetative biomass. And now for the image acquisition, this is done by um, Dr. Amir's lab. So to maybe to just keep it simple, because for me, it's also complicated, but we have this tractor, which is our ground-based platform and mounted to it are two cameras that would take uh, images. And this platform would be pulled by the tractor over the beds and then until it uh, uh, until the bed ends and then goes back to the second bed to take images again. And the following slide will show you just how it works in the field. So this is Ali Perez um, help, who's helping us, who helped us with the uh, image data collection. And as you can see, it goes over the bed and runs over uh, until the bed stops. And recently, just this uh, season, um, Dr. Kevin Wang is now helping us with the image data collection with um, a different platform, just wanted to show you. So this is um, what he's using, which is, I find very cool. It's like a toy. It's, and he just, um, this would just run over the field as well, and he can control it. So after image data collection, they also um, have to process the, uh, the images and uh, they develop an automated canopy, dele uh, canopy delineation protocol because imagine we have a lot of uh, uh, image data. These are collected every week, every week and doing it manually to just uh, put the borders for the strawberry plants it takes a lot of time so uh, they really did a, a great job doing that and yeah I forgot to mention the QR code is there in case you guys are interested in knowing more about the process that they do so now we move on to the ground truth data collection which is from our which is the data that we collect from our part so um, we measure fresh weight, dry weight, canopy density score, and plant height every week. And as you can see here, so you can see plots that have plants still and empty plots where the plants have been collected already. And um, just wanted to mention that we are uh, we're collecting data using a custom made app just because it's easier to um, easier for us to see the data in real time make sure that the data are collected properly just a quick side note in case you guys are interested in knowing more about the app i'm open to a discussion with you guys it's very convenient that's my uh, my observation. <laughs> and now we move to the data analysis. So this is just a quick part because of combining all the image data and our ground truth data, we developed a model using um, uh, multiple regression. And this is the, uh, the model that we came up with. And this is... Uh, also similar to what um, Dr. Amir's lab developed. And now 
we have a way to estimate our uh, vegetative biomass. Um, I forgot to mention biomass is the uh, dry weight of a plant. So it's, um, it's made up of the plant's resources. And so um, it's a good indication of yield. However, for us, we, um, we cannot afford to measure biomass manually. Why is that? This requires destruction of the plants, right? So, and we are collecting data every week. So we cannot afford to kill our plants to measure biomass. And that is why this is very important for us. Like, okay, finally we are able to measure something that we haven't measured before. So moving on, so what do we do now with this? information. So here is where our genomics trial is. So now we want to see the, we want to estimate the biomass of our breeding materials and look at the genetics behind it. So I mentioned stage two is where we do our preliminary yield trial also. So now we have a new um, a new trait. This I just wanted to show the distribution of bio, of, of biomass. So as you can see, it has there's definitely va variation in the vegetative biomass in our breeding program, which is a good indication that uh, we can probably select for. Um, moderately sized plants. And I've mentioned earlier, this is the regular traits that we collect. Or, and now we have new um, traits that we've added. So now we go to genetic correlations. Um, genetic correlations, just to keep it simple, just um, the association of the genetic effects of different traits. So just to mention that um, there is a low to moderate correlate, genetic correlation between biomass and uh, early biomass and early marketable yield. And this is also shown in the total season and there's even a negative correlation at one point. <laughs> but um, so the original plan was maybe it's possible to use bio, uh, the predicted biomass to, um, to um, indirectly select for high yielding varieties. But uh, to, when we thought about it more, our goal is really to develop high yielding varieties that without simultaneously increasing uh, plant size. So we wanna keep it moderately sized, but high yielding. So we decided to uh, scale our um, yield, uh, marketable yield data on a plant biomass basis. And that is what we did. And we came up with new, traits to explore. So um, early average weight on a predicted biomass yield basis is just um, average weight divided by the predicted biomass. And same goes with the marketable rate, uh, yield and so on. So these are the new traits that we currently have. So now we go to heritabilities. Heritabilities is just um, proportion of your uh, phenotypic variants or um, the variants in your physical in the physical attributes of your plants that are due to genetics. And as you can see, um, even the biomass and the traits that are scaled on a biomass basis do have 
uh, moderate to high heritability. I would say high because um, based on my experience with biomass yield, um, I, of course, it depends on the crop, but from the crop that I used to work on, we even get a heritability of 0 0.15, 0 0.10. So this is really good <laughs> heritabilities. And this can be seen in the total season heritabilities as well. So this is good news that we can, uh, we can improve uh, these traits, especially the uh, marketable yield on a biomass basis. On a biomass basis. So now what do we do with this data? So what? Well, we have this, we, we know that we can improve it. So we go back to this slide, how busy this area is. So this is where we, we currently used this information. So for the uh, crossing season of this, uh, this of the of the 2020-2023 season, so we've used the early marketable yield on a biomass basis and the total marketable yield on a biomass basis as a variable in our selection index to help us decide which parents are going to be used for our crossing materials. And this, I'm, yes, we do have the selection index, but at the same time, we also combine this with all our field evaluations, marker, data. But the good thing is we are able to use this predicted biomass to, um, to select for parents and this year, uh, we just finished the crossing last month, and we have 76 combinations for the main uh, breeding materials. 38 of those are for neo resistance or neo pestalozhopsis resistance. 34 miscellaneous, miscellaneous from um, collaborations with USDA from Maryland, uh, Australian materials other um, uh, disease resistance trials like macrofemina. And we are really excited of seeing how those seedlings would look like. Just another emphasis that we have the custom made app that we use in our uh, crossing season, which really helps us track uh, how many emasculations and pollinations that we've done in each day. And uh, moving forward, um, this uh, biomass project or the phenomics project will uh, go on as part of our program and it will be used for our uh, selections of parents. And I believe also when we select for um, materials that are going to be uh, moved to the advanced selections. And uh, we are not stopping with biomass. So this is just the start. Actually, this season, we also started looking at crown number. So the, uh, the goal there is to be able to predict the uh, how many crowns our breeding materials will develop throughout the season with the goal of testing them uh, under disease trials because um, the, I, the hypothesis is maybe it's possible to for the plant to survive better if they have a bigger crown. So that is still the hypothesis, but we're working on that. And who knows in the future, we, we are not just going to predict biomass, but yield itself. So um, the future is uh, exciting. So I think uh, it's really a good, uh, for me at least, it's very and an very exciting project to work on. 
So with that, I would like to thank the <laughs> UF Strawberry Reading and Genetics Lab, everyone, and uh, also even the Strawberry Molecular Genetics and Genomics Lab for all the help that they've done in this project. Of course, Vance Whitaker for entrusting me with this project. Luis Osorio and Sujit Verma for helping me a lot with the data, uh, data analysis. Jen Fan is actually uh, the one who started with this project so, and did the first year data, ground truth data. And Sai Wang, Dr. Amir, and Ali for helping us with uh, data, image data acquisition. Same as uh, with Dr. Kevin Wang, who's helped us this season. Uh, previous interns, Maria, Maria Gallardo and Juan David Pardo for doing a lot of the ground truth data collection for us. And with that, I would like to thank everyone for listening. And just in case you're interested, I, we ha I have a profile in the GCREC website. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can also scan this. But please scan the speaker evaluation because I'd really love to hear feedbacks from everyone. And with that, thanks again for listening. Yes. Yes. So uh, thanks, uh, nice presentation. Uh, the only question I have, like you showed the correlation, genetic correlation, the heat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was some negative correlation mm -hmm. that created by the biomass. So did the correlation change when you apply the weight method, when you weighted against the biomass, did the correlation change? <laughs> the, okay, let's go back to that slide. Thank you. This one, right? Right. So biomass. Yes. But the thing is, of course, it's going to have a, a positive correlation because this is uh, scaled. Uh, this is also a marketable yield scaled, just scaled on a biomass basis. But yeah, it did improve. It makes it better. Yes, yes, yes. So that, that's all I mean. Yes. Thank yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite informative. I have two questions. And the first one is your biomass is estimating equation. How accurate is it? R squared is uh, 0.77%, which I think is good. The second question is, what other factors do you think might uh, be impacting biomass that you're not talking about? Um, weather is definitely one of the factors, um, but we, uh, we don't uh, consider that. But the thing is, um, just to mention the biomass prediction, so it's not really a weekly data. And so it's just uh, one, uh, three time points in the whole um, growing season. And so it's difficult for us to really, uh, to really uh, include information about the weather. If we have, um, if we have weekly data of that, I think it'll be helpful. Yes, so I, I think that that's a correct point because in most plants, uh, the genetics play a part in biomass, but again, uh, other factors like root length, it's sufficient to use water. Yes, like fertilizer. Yes. So do you see yourself in the future kind of including in those parameters? Of the model? Um, but that is a very um, difficult, <laughs> probably not at least for, from a breeder's side, because I think um, what we're doing, especially uh, for uh, fertigation, we are using the same fertigation as um, 
as a regular farmer would do. So we would consider it as something that will be uniform. So that is my uh, idea. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for your presentation, Cheryl. It's very nice. Um, I'm wondering, I have a couple of questions. The first one would be um, in like commercial production, when when the plants are you know spaced at a certain length and as the season goes on, that space eventually fills. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering if you think uh, the the way the plant behaves when it's Touching the other plant, and you know, it's in a, it's more so restricted, and maybe it doesn't get as much um, photosynthesis done because it's, you know, part of the plant is being covered by the other plants. If that would change how it allocates its biomass compared to, if you have an open row and you're cutting the plants, and then you know, at a certain point, the plant is able to spread itself out more. Do you think that has any bias in the measurement at all, or it's kind of a, you know, well, I. But because the the, the uh, biomass, um, the the phenomics trial, it's um, although we are cutting each plot, but the remaining plots will still be at least um, planted at the same space. So I think there will be maybe there will be slight problems, especially with the ones at the border, but majority of them will still be the same growing condition as how we grow it in the farmer's field. And, and then my other question is, um, so you mentioned that the, the biomass ground truth measurements, what you're showing like here, that's the dry, dry biomass. Mm -hmm. um, is that, I would assume that it's very highly correlated with the, the fresh weight as well, the dry weight, the fresh weight, but is that true or? No. We didn't look at that. I, we just focus on the dry biomass. Okay. Yeah. So just awesome. remove the water content uh, factor. Sure. Yeah. Because I was wondering too, like if you're, you know, the images is obviously measuring the fresh weight or when it, you're, you're getting an image of the fresh plants. So I'm sure there's a high correlation between dry weight. There's a possibility, yes. That maybe something is lost there, but there's a lot of factors. So. <laughs> yes, but remember that um, our ground truth data is the dry biomass. Yeah. So uh, that's being used to predict how the dry biomass of the clonal trials will be 